I open hereby this academic session in which uh, Ms. Raquel Videira will defend her academic thesis, transcription factors, microRNAs, and extracellular physicals at the crossroad of right and left heart failure. And I welcome, of course, the candidate, and we wish her lots of success, and also with the paranyms, and of course, also her supervisors, Professor Da Costa Martins, and uh, Professor Falcao PMS. And also, of course, the opponents on site and online, and also the audience online and on site. But before we start the defense and the opposition, I give you the floor for a short presentation about your work. Dear Mr. Prorector, members of the Corona, dear colleague, family, and fans, today I'm going to present my thesis on transcription factors, micronase, and extracellular vesicles at the crossroad of right and left heart failure. So the heart is one of the first organs to be formed, and it pumps blood since then until the moment we die. Throughout our life, the heart is exposed to multiple damage that, then, that can compromise its function and lead to heart failure, a condition where the heart cannot pump blood efficiently and could end with a premature death. In fact, heart failure affects millions of people worldwide. Without an efficient treatment, 55% of these will die within five years. But what is the impact of heart failure? Well, if you're a patient with heart failure, as you just saw, your life expectancy is decreased, but also your life quality, since you can depend on your family and friends to perform basic tasks. But even if you're not a patient with heart failure, you still impact by it. Because patients with heart failure are frequently hospitalized to receive surgery or treatment, which overload the healthcare systems and other institutions involved. At last, heart failure still has a huge impact on economic, because millions of euros are spent each year due to heart failure. So finding a treatment is extremely urgent, but also extremely challenged, because heart failure is an end result of multiple cardiovascular diseases, therefore could be achieved by multiple paths, and involves several regulators. So our aim was to investigate the role of these regulators on the road to heart failure. But starting with the basics, the heart is commonly divided into left and right. And frequently, the left heart, the left heart receives fresh blood from the lungs and sends it to the whole body, while the right side of the heart receives venous blood from the whole body and sends it into the lungs to be renewed. Like the heart, heart failure is also commonly divided into left and right. However, most of the studies of heart failure are focused on the left heart failure due to its high prevalence. But treatments against left heart failure may not be applied against right heart failure, which has been overlooked throughout the years. But the difference between left and right are not only in morphology and function. In fact, this difference starts as early as embryonic development, where the primitive left and right heart have origins in different cardiac progenitor cells. Throughout this stage, the both sides of the heart are exposed to different regulators, like transcription factors, that dictate if the prim primitive right or left heart will be formed. I just mentioned transcription, uh, transcription factors, but what are those? Well, if you think that the DNA is like a map containing all the possible roads, transcription factors are like traffic lights, so they tell us if we can or not pursue that road. We're going to start by focusing on a transcription factor named HEN2 and its role on left and heart uh, failure. So HEN2 is a transcription factor very important during the embryonic heart because its expression will dictate the formation of the primitive right heart, and without HEN2, the right heart will not be formed. So we just clearly saw that the right and left heart have different origins, but does this mean that in injury they are also different? Well, left heart injury due to increased pressure is typical of patients with high blood pressure, like hypertension, aortic stenosis, and eventually heart failure. Since we cannot use patients to study the role of N2, we'll be mimic uh, increased pressure injury in mice. And we're going to use mice because they are easy to manipulate and to control, so you can get homogeneous conditions. They are also like an accelerated version of the disease. So after an injury, both, um, both patients and mice showed increased levels of N2, which led to an increase in cell size, the formation of a scar, and an enlarged heart, which are feature features of a damaged heart. In the end, we have heart failure. 
But if we block the hand two levels in, uh, in, in mice with the left heart injury, what we observed was a decrease in cell size, a decrease in the size of the scar, and a smaller heart. So suggesting that there was a recovery of cardiac function. So HEN2 is an important target against left heart failure. But what happens in right heart failure? So right heart injury due to increased pressure is typical of patients with pulmonary hypertension. And once again, we can mimic this injury by performing an increased pressure damage on the right side of the, heart, uh, of the heart of mice. Both patients and mice showed increased levels of HEN2 after injury. And uh, like was uh, observed before, there is an increase in cell size, formation of a scar, and an enlarged heart, which compromised cardiac function. But when we block these increased HEN2 levels, uh, in mice, uh, in injury in mice, what, uh, what we saw was that cells that were already big grew even bigger. There was no change in the size of the scar and large heart became even enlarged. So there was a worsening of the cardiac function. In summary, there are distinct responses of the, of the injury right and left heart to alter hand to levels. So after an injury, both sides of the heart increase hand to expression. But if we block this expression, the right side had an impaired cardiac function, while the left side had a preserved cardi cardiac function. This uh, may contribute to a target and personalized medicine, where we should always look at both sides of the heart before applying a treatment, and also do the same after applying it, the, this treatment. From now on, we're going to focus on left heart failure uh, due to its high prevalence, and particularly uh, on heart failure due to increased pressure. In a pathology, call it aortic stenosis. So the aorta is a big vessel that drives the, blo the blood from the left ventricle through the whole body through the um, aortic valve that controls the blood flow. However, in aortic stenosis, the opening and closure of this valve is compromised and could lead to a damaged heart and eventually heart failure. In order to avoid heart failure, patients uh, need to be treated. And one of the possible treatments is aortic valve replacement surgery. So after this surgery, the sick heart can show signs of recovery. And um, yeah, patients that benefit from, from the surgery because the heart is closer to a healthier state than to heart failure are classified as responders. However, for, for unknown reasons, some of the patients show signs of a very sick heart after surgery they, that is closer to heart failure than to a, a healthy heart. They do not benefit from sur surgery and therefore they are classified as non-responders. Since cardiac surgery is associated with multiple risks, it is important to have a predictive marker that tells us if the patients will or not benefit from, the, from this surgery. So microRNAs are small non-coding RNAs, meaning that they do not codify a protein that regulate gene expression, are frequently altered in cardiac pathologies, and they, they can be present in cell and extracellular fluids, like the blood. Consequently, they are easy to obtain. They display a high degree of sensitivity and specificity, which are features of a good marker. So our goal was to understand if we could use blood microRNAs as markers to predict if a patient will or not recover from surgery. For that, we use a group of aortic stenotic patients indicated to surgery, and we withdraw blood before surgery and collect clinical uh, data before and six months after the surgery. After these six months, we also group patients into responders and non-responders according with the healthy state of the heart. So if it was close to a heart failure, they were classified as non-responders. If they were close to a healthy heart, they were classified uh, as responders. Some of the clinical parameters that we collect were age, sex, body mass, cardiac function, and current use blood biomarkers like the BNP. However, none of these uh, parameters could help in distinguish between the two groups and could help in predicting if a patient will or not benefit from surgery, highlighting that new predictive tools are urgently needed. We also measured the expression of five different microRNAs, and two of these, LED7B3P and MIR133A3P, were differentially expressed among patients. So the levels were higher in non-responders compared to responders. This um, suggests that 
their diagnostic or prognostic value should be further tested in larger cohorts. So in summary, currently there are no efficient biomarkers that predict recovery, and MID-133 A3P and let 7 b 3 p were differentially expressed among patients, and therefore they should be tested in larger cohorts. This also can contribute to a target and personalized medicine, since each patient will have a therapy according with their microRNA specific profile. Also, this is a cheap alternative and fast because you only need a small amount of blood and you don't need the use of expensive machines. So far, we saw that transcription factors and microRNAs could inform us on the development of heart failure, but also cardiac communication could play a role in this. So the heart is um, composed by several types of cells, like cardiomyocytes that are responsible for the contractile function of the heart, endothelial cells that comprise the vessels, and fibroblasts that are responsible for the scaffold of the heart. They need to communicate among each other in order to maintain cardiac function. But how they do this? Well, in a healthy heart, the cells can communicate with each other by releasing extracellular vesicles that are bilipidic membrane particles that can transport cargo. So you can think of them like an UPS driver that can transport package or message between the different cell types. However, if this package is damaged or cardiac communication is altered, the heart could get sick and we could have heart failure. Up to date, there are no efficient tracing models to study cardiac communication via extracellular vesicles. So here we're going to propose a new tool for this that is like a tracking system based on color switch. So the donor cells that are the cardiomyocytes transport a package to recipient cells that could be endothelial cells or fibroblasts. And here we introduce the tracking system where a red notification is on. Whenever the package is received, a green notification will appear. Otherwise, the red notification will stay on. So we test our um, tracking system in these both cell types and evaluate color switch. As you can see, our system works, but different types of cells seem to, to have different switching rates. We also test our model in a 3D structure in engineered heart myocardium that is like a small heart on a chip composed of uh, donor cells, cardiomyocytes, and recipient cells, there are stromal cells. We return to um, evaluate color switch and only 3% uh, of the recipient cells turn green. So in summary, our method works in both 2D and 3D and granted the study of uh, endogenous extracellular vesicles and different types of cells have different responses to extracellular vesicles. So in conclusion, uh, my dissertation cover both fundamental, translational and clinical, um, yeah, clinical settings. Um, in chapter two, we conclude that targets against left heart failure may not be applied into right heart failure, like the case of N2. On chapter four, we um, suggest two new predictive markers based on microRNA expression to predict if a patient will or not benefit from aortic valve replacement surgery. And on, on chapter six, we propose a new uh, tra tracking tool, tracing tool, um, to study cardiac communication via extracellular vesicles. All of these contributed to a personalized and improved medicine that results in a healthier society, a decreased economic burden, and new tools for pharmaceutical industry. Thank you all for your attention, and now I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation, and uh, we will now start with the opposition, who have a few minutes more than we expected, which is good. And we start with the uh, uh, first opponent, who is also the chair of the assessment committee, and that's Professor Slimer. And she's a professor of cardiovascular pathophysiology in the University of Maastricht. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, thanks for your clear presentation and the lessons on the trafficking in the heart. I really enjoy the thesis, but also very much appreciate uh, your um, illustrations here and in the uh, presentations. And of course, um, congratulations to this joint uh, do double doctorate with uh, both Portugal and Maastricht and your, all your supervisors. From the propositions, dear candidate, I see you admire women in science and medicine. That's always good, eh? women in STEM. Um, these all women, these women all knew how to do sound experiments. And you have a very good supervisory team, so you know the basics. Change one factor at a time, 
always use positive and negative controls and you know make sure you have sufficient replicates or power that's what i tell my students all the time they don't always listen um, but let's see and do a little experiment of our own today and see how sound your experiments were in this thesis uh, dear highly esteemed opponent thank you for your kind words and sorry, I didn't understand the, the question. Could you repeat? That is very correct, because I haven't asked one yet. Uh, okay. So that's <laughs> one point for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, um, was, I was not sure, but since you stopped, I was <laughs> no like, questions, I no didn't questions. understand. <laughs> I'll talk a bit slower. Um, so um, the aim of your thesis is really clearly stated in the introduction. Okay. You want to find molecular players that difference between right and left ventricular hypertrophy. So I was wondering if you can start by describing maybe the traits of the mouse models on ref right ventricular hypertrophy. Yeah, okay. So now, <laughs> dear uh, Eileen Stephen Obonin, thank you for your kind, uh, kind words and for your question. So uh, the PUB model, the pulmonary artery uh, bending model, uh, it's a model that could be used to mimic pulmonary hypertension and could induce right ventricle uh, remodeling, maladaptive remodeling. However, this is more um, a compens compensatory mechanism, is not as severe as uh, we see in uh, humans. Uh, some of the traits are just what I showed, so hypertrophy, um, yeah, change uh, fibrosis, an enlarged heart, and uh, yeah. And then hypertrophy on one side or two? So, depends if you're talking about uh, humans or mice, but if it's just mice, mice. Um, we, we, we have another paper from Friedberg in 2018 that stated the same results as ours. So we also see a near hypertrophy on the left side of uh, mice after a pub surgery. So we cannot explain exactly why this, uh, this happens, but maybe the septum can have an influence on this, but these same results are um, reproduced. However, in uh, my uh, results, we just saw an increase in, on the markers and not on the cell size, that is like uh, hypertrophy. And uh, this could be due to other mechanisms like microRNAs, um, and we should have evaluated the protein expression that we did not to understand if the heart was becoming hypertrophic or not. Okay, so basically okay. you are studying a model and you want to study, you want to study the hand 2 in there mm -hmm. and you want to have right ventricular hypertrophy but you also have um, left ventricular hypertrophy. So basically you're changing two factors at the same time, the hand 2 knockout and you have two sides of hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. In your discussion, you're kind of negative about models and I'll leave a little bit of opening for, for the next questions. Um, but if it's not possible to create this uh, right ventricular specific model uh, biologically or biomechanically, can you think of a, a genetic model where you could study HAN2 only in one side and not on two sides? Um, and you, you can I, design I, a new, totally new model in your mind. Yeah, I would like to have a, a correct answer for that, but I, I think I don't, So, because it's so difficult to... Um, distinguish between right and left cardiomyocytes. So we know that sometimes the markers could be different, but there is not only a specific marker for the right or a specific marker for the, for the left. So regarding the mouse models, uh, no, I would probably try to use a 3D model uh, organ on a chip and use a multi-chamber and expose some types of cells with the pressure that the right ventricle is usually exposed and the uh, other types of cells in the, in the another chamber uh, exposed to the pressure that uh, left ventricle is, is So usually you don't think exposed. it's currently uh, possible to find a Cree driver of uh, just a right ventricular cardiomyocytes or a left ventricular cardiomyocyte? From what I read, no, but I could be mistaken. But uh, and, right and now... Could you think of an experiment maybe where you could make such a thing? Could you find those markers? Uh, I, I would to find the markers or to mi mimic? Okay. Um, yeah, I would possibly do single cell sequencing or just, um, yeah, and to understand which uh, markers are expressed in the right ventricular cardiomyocytes 
and the left ventricle cardiomyocytes sites and understand what are these markers, not only the RNA sequencing, but also maybe mass spectrometry to understand the proteins. Also the MIRNOM could play a role in this. Um, yeah, and probably I would try to find <laughs> these markers. Yeah, sounds but like a good approach. And yeah. maybe if your supervisor has more money or you can have a postdoc, you can then spend a lot of years probably doing this, but that's good. So, and then at least you would change only one factor, right? You would only change hand two and one side of the heart and not expression in both. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was other, con other considerations when you're doing proper experimentation, and nam namely the negative and positive controls. Okay. So in chapter four, you study plasma microRNAs uh, yes. in aortic valve stenosis, and you try to look at um, um, good controls there, but microRNAs aren't very stable. Right, so you use this um, uh, best keeper analysis to see if mm -hmm. they are stably expressed, but they're actually not. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the third uh, part of proper experimentation, which is power, which is also a little bit you know, on the low side, as you already suggest. So I was wondering, considering that your experiments may not be optimal, how, how, how sure are you, what scientific arguments do you have that these two microRNAs are actually worth pursuing? So uh, when we're doing these experiments, we could uh, resource to different techniques like uh, the normalization through an endogenous and use the best, keeping, uh, best keeper analysis, but with us didn't uh, work. Also, you could use a uh, spike in, but also there are some papers reporting that if you use spike in, you may see the opposite uh, change that was actually happening. So what I would like to use is was a global normalization. So I would like to test more microRNAs and then can normalize based yeah, on global uh, normalization, so all the, the reads. But we didn't have enough microRNAs um, to do that and uh, also not enough patients. It seems like you have a proper plan. You were taught well about controls and I think my time is up and I'd like to give the word back to the projector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Slimer, for your position. We now come to the following opponent, who was also a member of the assessment committee, and that's uh, Professor Fenoy, and he's uh, head of the Department of Cardiology in the Maastricht University Medical Center. And today he has also accepted the role of secretary, for which I'm very grateful. Professor Fenoy. Thank you very much, Mr. Pro-Rector. <coughs> dear, dear, dear candidate, congratulations very much with this thesis, a really nice piece of work. Well done. And with that, of course, I would also like to congratulate your promotion team. Great work. For me as a clinician, it's always tough to look at these, at these, at these mar markers, actually, and to see how I can translate this into clinical practice. But actually, with chapter two, I thought we, we, I could really try to, 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 to find you and to see how, we could, how could I could this incorporate this in my work. And especially when you look at the introduction, it's all about how uh, right ventricular dysfunction should be studied more carefully in patients with heart failure. And I completely agree with that because that remains a, a big task and we still do not know which patient we should be treated, how, especially in the development of RV dysfunction. Especially with LV dysfunction, the future of the patient is really depending on RV dysfunction. But then when I look at the, the chapter and I continue to reading, then it was decided to go for pulmonary artery bending. And I was wondering, what was the decision actually to choose for a specific uh, uh, artery bending on the, on the right side to study the, the, the right ventricular dysfunction in heart failure itself? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your words. Um, yeah, we, we wanted to look for the hand to uh, roll on the right uh, ventricle failure. And um, I think Right now, PAP is the best model. Um, we could have other models of pulmonary hypertension that could also uh, induce right ventricle failure. Um, but I think this one is more specific just to the heart without, they may or may not ha have an uh, impact on the lungs that we did not access. But yeah, I think this one is more specific just to to mm, because the, when the you heart. go to your introduction, eh, you stated that the prognosis was of patients with heart failure, five years, uh, mm -hmm. half of the patients uh, will, will, will die, but that's mainly patients with left ventricular dysfunction. So when I was teached, uh, I taught cardiology, we have five groups of patients with elevated right-sided pressures, and one of them is primary 
uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, but there are four other groups. And, yeah. and one of the major groups is actually a ventricular dysfunction. So I was wondering how can I translate these data into patients with left ventricular dysfunction We tomorrow are actually the main group of my patients on my outpatient clinic. Yeah, I think you should always look into the right and left, uh, and left uh, side of the heart to evaluate their function because there are some molecules like uh, tri tricostin that uh, they work for, for the left heart dysfunction, but they do actually worse on the right heart uh, dysfunction. So I, I just think that these uh, results just highlight how you should always look at both uh, sides or yeah, if you could have biopsies and just do maybe a, a transcriptomic analysis or something to understand how good is the, the right heart of this um, of these uh, patients. Also look at the septum probably if there is already a deviation or not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think. Well, yeah. With that respect, because you're looking at both sides, I was actually, when I looked at your graphical abstract on page 21, mm -hmm. it's very nicely shown on the right side what pulmonary, pulmonary artery bending does, and on the left side. And you also have a, a line towards stuck, and, and you look especially, of course, on the left side. I was wondering, do you have any data or any idea what happens with TAC on the right side? Because that's done actually indirect a backward failure of the right ventricle so due to a TAC. What happens on the right side? Uh, where? Sorry, can you repeat? If you look at the graphical abstract on page 21, yes, you see PAB pointing to the left ventricle and the mm -hmm. right ventricle, but with T TAC, you only look yeah. at the left ventricle. Do you have any data also on the right side of that? Because I was interested what are the ex effects would be on the right ventricle with that situation. Okay, yeah. Uh, m I don't have it myself, but we know that uh, left uh, heart disease could also be... Um, a trigger of uh, right uh, ventricle uh, dysfunction. In fact, that is one of the groups uh, during a pulmonary hypertension. One of the groups, group three, is due to, le uh, to left side uh, disease. Um, and yeah, we know that if if this um, if this injury is continuous, it will affect the right heart. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I myself, I don't have any <laughs> data on, on that. So that's yeah. uh, future work, shall yeah. I say? Okay, very nice. Because I actually was intrigued by the pictures, especially, for example, on the MRs on 28, because sometimes the, our images from patients look worse while their heart is a little bit larger. So really congratulations with that. Um, a completely different question. Um, when I looked at your propositions, you, s you, you mailed them to us separately, um, I looked through all the proposition and I actually um, stuck at proposition eight. And okay. I was wondering with maybe one of your parents if you could read proposition eight. Uh, my Portuguese is not that good, probably. So not even mine. Oh, so okay. I will go with English. Uh, <laughs> These people whose faces are sometimes bright and sometimes rough. Okay, you made it yourself easy by only reading <laughs> English. But it's very good. Actually, I translated, I looked at the internet, and I got at a poem. Could you maybe help me what this sentence means? What the, what the, what the, why you put this as one of your propositions in your thesis? Yeah, this means that sometimes you could have bright ideas, and at a certain moment, that seems to be the right way. And on the other times, uh, these same ideas are just completely thrown down. For example, MicroRNAs, they were supposed to be like trash, right? Also extracellular vesicles, and now you, we understand their importance to, uh, yeah, also right ventricle uh, and, yeah, the heart. So it, it is more like, okay, sometimes you have these thoughts and uh, you, you think that you have all the knowledge and then everything is laid down. And the opposite, sometimes you think, okay, this is not worth it to study, and then you understand, I should have, have done that. <laughs> I'm very happy with the answers and I would like to give the word back to the program. Thank, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fanoy, for your opposition. Now we come to the following opponent, who is also a member of the assessment committee, that's Professor Gaumans. And she's a professor of molecular cardiovascular cell biology in the Leiden University Medical Center. And that is obviously in Leiden. And thank you for coming all the way from Leiden, Professor Gaumans, albeit online, because the University of Maastricht is always happy to have to receive guests from outside. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. 
Uh, dear Madam Candidate, um, I've read your thesis twice um, with great pleasure, and it was very nice to also have the version with uh, the, the cover, which is very nicely illustrated and shows the complexity at the outside as well as on the inside. And I would like to also congratulate your promotion team. Um, I was very happy with the propositions that you emailed, and I would like to have ask one of the paranyms to read a proposition number nine. Life is like a photography. We develop from the negatives. Yeah, and, and that one uh, really made me uh, think about uh, what you would mean with develop from the negatives, because you stand here as a, as a bright, young, independent scientist who developed from the student starting a PhD to now defending your piece of uh, art described in this book. So is, was there something negative that actually made you develop uh, in this independent scientist that you are today? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and question. Um, yeah, about the personal level, yes, there was uh, something uh, negative, right? I, I needed to change country three times and I always need to start over, which is not always easy. But uh, I also feel that I grew a lot uh, and yeah. About the negative results regarding more uh, scientific point of view, when I when we start with the hand two um, and e evaluate its role on uh, right ventricular dysfunction, we thought that it was going to be easy that uh, hand two would be an amazing target for both ventricles. We'd have like this therapy breaking through, and then suddenly we start to see, well, it was not what we expected. But actually that, mm, so the first, I would say the first days I would a bit down because you just think, okay, how can I go and explain this? But then it becomes interesting, like how different the ventricles are. I cannot just assume that because it's working on one side, we will work on the other. So yeah, I, I and also negative results are super important for, um, yeah, research and uh, yeah. I agree. I think that as long as your positive and negative control, as already stated, are, are kind of in place, the negative results is actually that bring science forward. As long as we also have enough positive control to keep the spirit high. Um, I would like to discuss with you the left and the right side of the heart. Because as you know, you know, we're trying to understand uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, a rare disease in the class one of pH. Where we, where we see that there's a mutation linked to disturbed TGP to BMP signaling that eventually has the right heart side, right side of the heart um, failing. And it's difficult to study mechanisms in the right or in heart tissue per se. So that's why you, know, you also mentioned that engineered heart tissue actually might be the way to try to understand a bit of mechanism or also try to study new treatments. And then if we look at IPS-derived cardiomyocytes, do you think it's feasible to have IPS cardiomyocytes that resemble the right side of the heart? Um, I think in the future will be. Right now, I'm still not uh, completely sure. It would be interesting to use uh, already um, cells from patients from the right side of the of um, yeah of the ventricle of patients, uh, and to see what what are the difference between right and left. I think also what I mentioned just to expose them to different pressures. Uh, maybe you can have uh, some answers there. And um, yeah, I yeah I, I I'm not sure if uh, we can do, we can do that now. But I think maybe in the future we'll understand, okay, what are the different markers? Because we also know that the, there are different uh, cardiomyocytes populations among the right versus left ventricle, um, yeah, among the, the right, right and left ventricle. So yeah, maybe we could have an answer on that, but right now I'm, I'm not sure if we can do that. 
Yeah, I, th I think that's also the discussion that we always have with people that try to use IPS cells and IPS drives quite in my side, because in addition, I think, you know, there's not so clear differences left and right. And I think that that maybe it's indeed the pressures. Do, so do you think that at the end, we need to treat or find a way to uh, uh, physiologically treat them differently to compare them to the left and right side, rather than genetically trying to make them right and left side cardiomyocyte? Uh, I think both, because we also see that, for example, during uh, increased pressure, there are different uh, pathways that are activated between the right and the left side. So, for example, the right uh, ventricle dysfunction um, activates the wind pathway to help changing the uh, from oxidative phosphorylation to uh, glycolysis, and this pathway is not activated on the uh, left side. Um, so I think that both should be uh, very important, not only yeah, physiologic physiologically, but also the, um, trans the yeah, transcriptomics and genetic. And, and you know, as we, as we kind of focus on uh, cardiomyocytes left and right, uh, we kind of tend to forget the, the fibroblasts, which of course are important players in uh, fibrosis and stiffness. Um, do you think that there is, or do you know anything about if there's a difference in the fibroblast from the left versus the right side of the heart? Um, I know that the, regarding their origin, they are different. So the left ventricle fibroblast came both from epicardio and endocardio. And I think the right ventricle is just from epicardio. So already there, it's, uh, there are some difference. Um, we also know that the right ventricle express more extracellular matrix uh, genes. They're, they have more immune cells that can also contribute for this fibrosis at the basal level, so without the disease. Um, yeah, so I think already here you can see that maybe the fibroblasts could be uh, different. Yeah, so it's it's not only the myocytes, so it's more than just uh, just the cardiomyocytes that we have to take a look at. So with the, it's a kind of last question. Uh, so with the with the bending, you take uh, out of the equation the lung, and of course we know you know that the disease lung might have also impact uh, on the RV failure. Do you think that um, we kind of miss something using RV bending? Uh, and not look in uh, to uh, lung-induced right heart failure? Um, yes, w also with the PUB model, we could have uh, looked at the lungs, but we missed the, that part. But uh, yes, it would be interesting to analyze that in a, yeah, in a next, in the future. Um, yeah, also the the... We could also have used other models, but right now we were more prone to the right side of the heart. But also with the lung damage, we could affect the right right heart, but not as uh, specific as yeah. just the pub model. We have to start somewhere, and I think that you paved the the way for many more PST students to come to solve this uh, puzzle. I'd like to thank you for your answers and give the word back to the project. Thank you, Professor Gaumans, for your position. Then we come now to the following opponent, who is also a member of the assessment committee, and that's Dr. Pinto Do'o. She's, her expertise is stem cells in regenerative biology, and that is in the University of Porto in Portugal. And thank you, Dr. Pinto Do, for coming all the way from Portugal, albeit online, but we're always happy to see guests from abroad. Thank you so much, Mr. Correcto. Um, I would like to congratulate the candidate uh, for the work uh, presented and discussed uh, today. And I also would like to congratulate our colleagues who supervised this work. That said, and because the time is short, I would like to discuss a few points with the candidate. And um, to start with, I would like the candidate to go back to something that has been tackled uh, before in this discussion, and that concerns with the development of the heart. 
In the introduction to this dissertation, uh, the candidate uh, very well states that uh, during development, the heart is uh, um, made up from two distinct uh, origins. I would like the candidate to explore a little bit of that and tell me on how the different origins in development can relate to uh, differences that uh, we see on function and dysfunction of the heart in the adult. And this goes to uh, the introduction of the candidate where we see a statement of some of the left ventricle and right ventricle differences can be explained by the specific left ventricle and right ventricle intrinsic features regarding their origin, their origin, molecular signature, etc. So could you please uh, explore a little bit of these differences in origin that you actually see reflected later on? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and question. Um, so the left and right uh, ventricles have different origins. So uh, the right ventricles comes from um, the second heart field, while the left ventricles, the, the, its origin is from the left heart field. Um, also then during the linear tube, um, and um, yeah, the looping of the heart, they start to be exposed to different uh, transcription factors. For example, the hand tool and uh, TBX20 uh, are um, responsible for the formation of the right heart, while the uh, TBX5 and uh, hand one are uh, responsible for the formation of the left heart. Um, so already here we, we can see that they were expressed to, uh, uh, they were exposed to different regulators, and maybe this could have an impact in the um, yeah during their their function. Um, yeah, also during the cardiac embryonic development, they they yeah they are exposed to different uh, um, yeah different pressures then that they are accentuated during the uh, adult heart. Okay, and concerning the molecular signature for each of the chambers, could you please tell us um, whether we can define a specific signature for the left versus the right ventricle? Um, well, uh, there are, as I said, there are different uh, cardiac uh, cardiomyocytes populations that express different markers, and that could be is also different. Also, the immune cells and the ECM genes are more present in the um, right ventricle than uh, on the left ventricle. As for microRNA uh, signature, we have four uh, specific microRNAs that are expressed during uh, right ventricle dysfunction, like MIR34A. Um, but curiously, these microRNAs are, um, they are not expressed in cardiomyocytes, they are more expressed in uh, endothelial cells and uh, uh, fibroblasts, so. So this leads me to actually ask you whether you uh, have some evidence or hint of whether uh, differences, intrinsic differences on cardiomyocytes from the left and the right uh, side of the heart could be responsible for functional uh, or dysfunctional aspects. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, a signature between different uh, sides of the heart could be responsible for their, um, for their um, f function then and response to, in to injury, right? Yeah. Yeah, actually you were telling me um, differences on the other aspects of the microenvironment, such as the endothelial cells, the extracellular matrix. I was more concerned with the, the cardiomyocytes themselves and the, uh, 
molecular signature for that. But um, okay, so uh, and my question was uh, reported to that. Yeah, I, we know that they express um, they could express different markers. I did not access that. Um, yeah, maybe they can. They could be. Um, they could be responsible because, as I said, it seems like the wind pathway is activated during the the right ventricle, and it's not. It's one of the main pathways, uh, and it's not activated on the left ventricle. Um, so, yeah, we also know that the right ventricle is more uh, sensitive to hypoxia, and maybe this could be. Yeah, m maybe more on the endothelial cells and cardiomyocytes. So I, I think so, but I don't have any data on that. So, okay. And um, uh, at some point on your thesis, uh, while you were reporting your work on EVs, you also uh, stated that the EVs are double layer vesicles secreted by cells to mediate the intercellular communication and that may help maintain cardiac homeostasis. And um, I know you have here that may help maintain cardiac homeostasis, but still my question is, do you have uh, a robust experimental evidence uh, for this role on maintaining homeostasis? Short, uh, very short answer, please. Um, so there are some studies uh, reporting that if we block the, um, for example, exosomes formation, then uh, the cardiomyocytes that were injury, they could not uh, send these extracellular vesicles to endothelial cells and activate the um, uh, angiogenic process. Um, I did not study that particularly on my thesis, but yeah, there are some data on that. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm not, I cannot have another question, right? No, there's no time. I'm very sorry. sorry. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your position, Dr. Pinto. Then we come to the following opponent, who's also a member of the assessment committee. That's Professor Ferreira, and he's a professor in uh, biomaterials and stem cell-based therapeutics in the University of Coimbra, and that's also in Portugal. And also, thanks for coming all the way online from Portugal. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pro Hector. Uh, dear candidates, I would like to congratulate you and your supervisory team for the PhD thesis. Uh, the, origin the originality of uh, the work um, uh, is, uh, is uh, significant uh, in terms of uh, treatment and diagnostic, uh, in terms of heart failure. Um, my first question uh, are about chapter four. Um, so can you elaborate a little uh, more how you select um, uh, the micronase uh, that you, you, you have used for the characterization of your blood samples? Um, so for instance, uh, for me, it's not clear how many um, uh, papers have been reviewed, um, if other micronase targets were identified, but not quantifying the blood samples, uh, uh, why, why not uh, micronase in circulating extracellular vesicles as biomarkers and so on. I will be very thankful if you could elaborate a little bit more about this. So I will esteem opponent, thank you for your words and your question. Um, so the micronase selection was based on a literature search. So I think in the end, the, yeah, this paper needs to mention reverse uh, remodeling and uh, um, my or myocardial recovery and micronase or MIRS, uh, as, a, as I stated on my thesis. And then I think at the end we got around 33 papers um, and we um, did a panel of uh, micronase then we also select them according with the viability that we, the primary viability that we had in our lab. Um, yeah, what, yeah, why you didn't use exosomes? That would be an interesting question, but um, probably we'll need to first exolate the exosomes, and for that we you need a higher amount. 
Uh, also, we use EDTA and it's uh, stated on the literature that EDTA could alter the, um, the quantification of uh, uh, exosomes. So th there is a decrease and we did use EDTA. Um, and like this, we can, I mean, also ex exosomes or other extracellular vesicles are, pre are present on these um, on these uh, samples that we use plasma, they are just not exclusive, uh, exclusively uh, exos uh, exosomes, uh, microRNAs or exosomal years. Um, so, no, no, that's fine, um, uh, candidate. So, can you elaborate, um, even uh, still connected to chapter four, can you elaborate uh, in the direct gene targets of uh, microRNA 133A uh, and LED 7B? So in the Artesis, you describe a little bit about the potential biological role of microRNA 133A, but no indication um, about the role of LET 7B. Uh, so can you elaborate a little bit more about this? Um, so uh, as you just said, 133A is a, an inhibitor of cardiac hypertrophy. Uh, LET 7B it's inversely uh, correlated with the cardiac uh, troponin I expression. Um, I think that their pathways uh, it could depend basically on also their cell type they are being expressed. Uh, but we know that LET 7B could have um, potential effect on proliferation uh, of of the cells. But um, yeah, I think it also could change according with the um, cell type. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, about chapter five, I enjoy very much to read your chapter five. Um, I'd like to have your opinion. Where do you think that um, most of cardiac microRNAs are in the exosomal or known exosomal fractions? And uh, uh, what levels of experimental evidence you have for, uh, for your selection? Um, I think well, I don't have a correct answer for that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> it's a difficult one. Uh, I think that, so. Microarrays could be also release um, release uh, by being connected with uh, HDL, um, and of course extracellular vesicles. Yeah, I. <laughs> but maybe uh, the most probable is going to say exosomes, but yeah, or extracellular vesicles, but I don't have any clinical data. I just think that between being released through uh, HDL or uh, extracellular vesicles, it is way more described in extracellular vesicles. So I tend to say that this is the correct answer, but without a really scientific res response, because just because they are more reported, it doesn't mean that they are yeah, the, 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 the quantity is higher there. Sure. Um, and uh, so in, in chapter five, you mentioned that modulation of no code RNAs can successfully prevent and even reverse cardiac um, uh, remodeling. Uh, um, so, and as you know, there are already some examples of microRNAs that uh, have reached the, f the phase of clinical trials. Uh, I'd like to have your opinion what are currently the main limitations in use of uh, non-coding RNAs for clinical use? Uh, uh, diagnostic markers or as therapeutic targets? No, as a potential therapies. Um, uh, yeah, so one microRNA could target a lot of uh, different mRNAs. So that if you're just uh, interfering with w one molecule, it could be good, but it could also be bad. Also, yeah, because you're changing like with multiple pathways and not just one. Um, another, um, yeah, disadvantage would be the probably the uh, delivery of the treatments. Also, the cell uh, specific. So, how can you just target one? Um, yeah, one. Uh, type of cells or and not all of them. Um, yeah, and then we need to make them, yeah, think more testings and more, more experience. Okay. 
thank you so much, candidate. I wish you the best, and I will give the word back to Mr. Pro Rector. Thank you, Professor Ferreira, for your opposition. Now we come to the following opponent, and that is Dr. Donners, and her expertise is vascular, pat vascular pathology in the University of Maastricht. Dr. Donners. Thank you very much. Um, dear candidates, um, as your final opponent, uh, of course, I also would like to congratulate uh, you and your supervisor team with a very nice uh, thesis. Um, I am very intrigued with this intercellular communication via uh, EVs, um, and I think you use a very elegant system uh, to study that. So my questions concern your chapter six, uh, which uh, um, study these EVs, and you mentioned in the introduction of, uh, of that ch chapter that um, in diseases such as uh, um, cardiac hypertrophy, um, the cardiac cell communication may be altered by modifying the EV sorting preferences, uh, which then in turn affects the uh, recipient cell function. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that particularly the modified proteins um, uh, would be sorted for cargo in these, uh, in these EVs. Now, I was wondering whether this change in EV co uh, composition, uh, modifying the recipient cells, uh, has a certain purpose, or do you think that uh, the, um, the donor cells just expose these EVs as, uh, to get rid of some kind of waste, and uh, do you think it's, it's a collateral damage that the uh, recipient cells are affected by these, uh, by these EVs? Okay. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your words and your question. Um, Yes, yeah, so EVs could be released by two ways, or there are two me mechanisms, is the stochastically, stochastically, uh, or they could be uh, uh, selected, uh, like the, their content. Um, I think it, it depends on which situation, but I, I think that they might ask help to other cells when we see that the release of uh, microRNAs that are pro-angiogenic um, to endothelial cells. I don't think that the, um, the, the donor cell wants to get rid of that. I think that they are uh, asking for help. Mm -hmm. um, also, when you see that um, this selection is not random and some studies reported that the microRNA content on these uh, vesicles was higher than on the donor cell. So I don't think they, they are trying to get rid of that. That was the initial thought when uh, extracellular vesicles were uh, discovered, that they were just like uh, sending uh, unwanted re uh, content. But, but couldn't it be both, that depending on, on the yeah, recipient cell, like, like for example a cardiomyocyte, which is targeted by these EVs, I can imagine they become diseased as well, so that's a, that's a well, feed yeah, forward mechanism, while for other donor uh, recipient cells you may indeed trigger a repair response, like the angiogenesis you mentioned. Yeah, it could be both, uh, also because extracellular vesicles comprise apoptotic bodies and not just uh, exosomes or microvesicles. Um, but I, I don't think we should uh, let go, that is everything random and... Uh, so you think yeah. it depends on the, the type EV, the composition of the EV, which cell is targeted and then is uh, yeah. either becoming diseased yeah, it, or helping it, repair? Yeah, yeah, I also think that it could be cell-specific mm -hmm. and not just cell-specific, but what is the environment around the, yeah. the cell and uh, yeah, on the recipient cells. Yeah, too. yeah I, I agree on that. So uh, my next question is about uh, figure four, where you show that uh, both fibroblasts and to a lesser extent also endothelial cells can take up these uh, EVs that you isolated from cardiomyocyte uh, conditioned medium. Um, however, the uh, amount of cells that are switching colors are uh, rather limited, and, and if you look later on in the 3D model, um, the amount of cells that you hit are even less. Um, so in the discussion, you mention uh, a couple of potential reasons why only few cells are, uh, are targeted, at least in the 3D model, where maybe the cells have lower metabolism, lower uh, cell cycle activity. <coughs> Um, and and uh, um, maybe also the collagen matrix that may interfere. But how about the amount of uh, EVs that are available? Um, how, ma how many uh, EVs that you use in the in vitro conditions? Because I couldn't find um, them anywhere. We did not quantify them. We use uh, 20 microliters after isolation. We still need to quantify them. But of course, that it could be one of the reasons that we have less EVs. So then we also need to treat these um, EHMs with uh, um, 
extracellular vesicles and see, okay, it's because of the quantity or is also, um, yeah, just because the cells are um, metabolic inactive mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. And, and if you would isolate EVs from uh, diseased cardiomyocytes, do you think that will uh, change the situation and the <coughs> results? Yeah. You may answer, but you may also say enough is enough. Yes, yeah, so that's one thing that we are trying to do. It's expose the uh, IPS derived cardiomyocytes to different type of conditions and analyze if the response is different. So if you have more fibroblasts, um, yeah, or if the direction change. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm happy to hear that we have uh, still enough to do uh, in, uh, in the research field. <laughs> and I give the word back. Thank you, Dr. Donners, for your opposition. Um, as a candidate, Ms. Videra, the time appointed, appointed for the defense has now passed and uh, the degree committee will withdraw to another room to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. And I ask you and your company and your guests online to await the results of our deliberation and our returns, our return in this room. With that, I suspend the meeting. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare. Here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the Skills Lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their change semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Camelot campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project that includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association.
If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round, but you get to use to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while. Who are we as a UM community? We are a group of people who love, talk, live, learn, work and think in a variety of ways. And we all want to be a valuable and valued member of our UM community. A community where everyone can feel safe, needs nurturing. To bring a community to its full potential, we all have a role to play. Every single one of us needs to be part of a moving conversation. To understand each other. To find help if you need it. Or to give help when asked. To connect with your peers and share some stories. And have some fun at the same time. Make space for new perspectives and broaden your horizon. Discuss. We don't have to agree, but we can learn. That diverse views are at the basis of our understanding. And including these views are the basics of a healthy community. Make a difference at your own pace. Join one of our active groups or become an ally. The first steps are not always easy, but let's help each other on this journey. Do you want to know more? Follow the UM's Diversity and Inclusivity Office on social media. Or well, check out maastrichtuniversity.nl forward slash diversity. I reopen this academic session. Yeah, are we here? Okay. 
I reopen this academic session. Uh, Ms. Raquel Videra, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and, of course, your defense. And in view of its positive verdict, verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And Professor Da Costa Martins is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Is this on? Okay, before we go to the nice part, I have to ask a very serious question. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? To be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon, upon you, Raquel Figuinha Videira, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Figuinha Fideira, dear Raquel, it is my great honor to be the first to congratulate you for the great milestone in your academic and professional career. I would also like to take this opportunity co to congratulate your family, boyfriend and friends, who I am sure somehow greatly contributed to bring you here to this day to obtain this degree. We know each other for a while now. I met you some years back, end of 2016, when you were first selected for an interview for one of my projects at the University of Porto. By then you strike me as being someone who likes to impress, who is determined and knows what she wants. It was by then very clear that you were the perfect candidate for the job, and in 2017 you started working on the Hand2 project, under my supervision, but more important, under the supervision of Ines, who was full-time at university by then, and still. For the ones who don't know, the department at University of Port is well known for their cardiac physiology and phenotyping expertise, but with a bit less molecular component. After spending some time in our lab here in Maastricht, Raquel realized that she would like to have a stronger molecular component in her work. And in order to accommodate her wish, we wrote and applied for a PhD student grant from the FCT, which was awarded. This was a mixed grant, meaning that two years would be completed here uh, in Maastricht and two years in Portugal, and that's how things happened. Raquel came to Maastricht to start her PhD with, as a double degree between the two universities. Because Raquel had been here before, her ad adaptation to the lab went very smooth, and very soon she made new friends, and you could hear her laughing throughout the corridors. Raquel worked hard during the past years, and as every PhD student is aware, things did not go smooth all the time, the negatives. While she could complete the hand to project by publishing in a very well-renowned journal, Cardiovascular Research, the mere 30D project, however, did not go as we expected, and after a while we had to change gears a bit. This was a pity, but on the other hand, it allowed Raquel to write a few grants on the topic, and she was granted a Fulbright and a BAFTA fellowship to go abroad to the lab of Professor Chris Hughes at Irvine University in California. This was, of course, a great achievement, and Raquel should be proud of this, at least I am. But unfortunately, we all were hit by COVID, and with the travel restrictions to the US, they were so strict that Raquel had to give up on the Fulbright and change the plans for the BAFTA. So that's when she went to Göttingen, to the lab of uh, Professor Zimmerman, there she went to learn how to work with induced pluripotent stem cells and cardiac 3D cultures. 
And although we could not see each other in person, it was clear in our meetings through Zoom that you really enjoyed your time there, even though you had to work very hard in the short time you were there. It has been like the Dutch song says, blood, sweat, and tran, which means blood, sweat, and tears. And maybe in your case, a bit more tears than usual, but you're here, you made it. <laughs> but now about Raquel in the lab, as a colleague, as my student. To be honest, Raquel always kept it very professional, very distant, I guess the Portuguese way, I don't know. And we never shared many personal experiences with each other. I would always get to hear things from others, like her preference for fast food, her addiction to donuts, her fear for becoming homeless when she gave up room in Maastricht a few days before flying back to Portugal, with the chance of, in the meantime, becoming positive for COVID. But luckily, she also become aware, became aware of the existence of support and shelters for homeless people in Maastricht. <laughs> While very professional at work, this was to totally not the case when we, go, when we were going out with the lab. I got to learn this during our team building event a few years back when we went canoeing in the Ardenna. Being the first in line, when to be the first, the winner, I was totally not aware of what was happening behind us until I started seeing everyone in their canoes completely soaked and wet. Before I even had the time to ask what happened to you guys, Raquel showed up and in no time I was completely soaked and wet. So a water fight started and we had a good time together with some of us even flipping the canoes over, losing pedals and even canoes. There were of course less good times and let's not talk about coffee being spilled over computers but I hope you will mostly remember the good ones and have learned from, bo from both good and bad. I hope your experience, experiences will, uh, with us will be useful in your p new position on the other side, industry, and be helpful in your future growth as professional, but maybe more important, as a person. I, and I'm sure I can also speak for Inish, wish you all the best. Once again, congratulations, Raquel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Da Costa Martins, for a beautiful audition. And dear Dr. Fidera, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. And uh, I hope you can celebrate it and have a great career. And I also uh, congratulate, of course, the people around you, family and friends, online and on site. And of course, your supervisors, Professor Da Costa Martins and Professor Falco Pires. I thank the members of the opposition uh, online and on site for their um, questions and their hard work. And of course, uh, the technical team, Luke Peters, Joshua Vedu, and Padel to make this uh, session possible. Now we've almost uh, come at the end of this uh, academic session. I'm going to tell you how we're going to go further. Uh, the streaming will be stopped very soon. Then uh, we ask the people here to leave the room and you can already go to the garden and then we will make a picture here so one of the with a photo <laughs> camera can stay here or an iPhone that's also good and uh, and then uh, we uh, take you to the stairs so we make another picture and then we come to the garden and after we have congratulated the candidate because we always go first then you follow us yeah everything clear then I close this meeting Maastricht University would like to extend warm congratulations to the PhD candidate and their supervisors on a successful PhD defense. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching.